Thank you, thank you very much. A very sad song from Olga Mutukuzi. Uh, for a sad circumstance that we find ourselves with COVID. Mikhail, am I all right? Mikhail? Yes, yes. Yeah, because I see a strange thing on the screen. 
My job is simply to welcome you all to the SAPAS Policy Dialogue Forum on Zoom and out there to on Facebook to the many who follow us and on YouTube subsequently. My job is simply to welcome you and also to, in, to introduce very briefly uh, the context, which is really uh, that the SAPAS Trust, which is a regional organization, has gone back to the region today uh, to remind us that we are part of a region, SADC. And in doing so, we have brought uh, a contemporary of mine, but more significantly, a former executive secretary of SADC, Simba Makoni, to remind us in the context of this pandemic on the need to revive the spirit that inspired SADC in the 80s and 90s, back to the drain board, so to speak, so we can put our heads together as a region around and in response to the pandemic. We are pleased also to have a high powered panel by no, by no means uh, unusual for us to get a minister of health, especially in these very busy circumstances that he finds himself in. Welcome, Minister Mukiza. Thank you very much for gracing the, for the forum. And of course, my sister Sheila from Botswana, Sheila Tlo, Paula Wunjani from Mozambique, and now dear child, uh, Matifadza Sachwayo Davis out there in Washington. And last but not least, a colleague of ours, Caleb Fundanga. I'll leave the rest to our moderator, Ms. Mbamakone, to take over from here. Thank you, Ibo. Boatard, Kazuai, Dumelang, Salibonan, Muribuanji, Abari, Nakaribuni. It is my great honor and privilege to be assisting us in our conversation this evening, afternoon, morning, wherever we are in the world. Um, it's a very important discussion on a subject that is very timely. The health of our nations hangs in the balance. My honor and privilege tonight is to hope that we can illuminate this topic for our leaders and for our citizens to take effective action to protect ourselves as best we can. I want to start by going to the original SADC Treaty, the Treaty of Vinduk in 1992, which offered the opportunity for a shared future for the people of Southern Africa. It reads under the subject, a shared future. The economies of Southern African states are small and underdeveloped. The countries of the region must therefore join together to strengthen themselves economically, politically, and I would add socially, even though it is not in the text of the treaty, if the region is to become a serious player in international affairs. That section goes on to add, the countries of Southern Africa will therefore work out and adopt a framework of cooperation which provides for common economic, political, and social values and systems. There is no better challenge to that ambition than the COVID pandemic that we're facing at the moment common social values and systems are in question at the moment. Can we together protect ourselves? The okay. concept note to this discussion has elaborated a number of issues, common. but the, the launch pad is system. the statement from President Newsy on January 29th at the moment. 
Can recommending we... that SADC ministers establish a strong regional collaborative strategy to pool resources together to urgently acquire the vaccine for distribution and from president and to develop manufacturing capacity for vaccines in the future there are many other aspects to this subject which the distinguished panel that we have tonight i'm sure will do justice to i will not take up time to introduce the panelists they have been presented their bio data has been presented and they are all household names anyway. So allow me the honor and privilege to invite Minister Zueli Mkize, the Minister of Health of the Republic of South Africa. Minister Mkize, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, my brother, Simba, Simba Makoni, and uh, the uh, convener, Comrade uh, Ibo. Uh, and of course, the esteemed, esteemed panelists. Uh, thank you very much for this very timely um, gathering where we have to reflect on what can be done to uh, deal with the crisis that we are all facing as a, as a, as a, as a, as a SADC region. We at this point are aware that uh, the uh, numbers in terms of uh, uh, positive cases recorded are beyond 3.5 million with uh, uh, 88,000 88, deaths in the whole of the continent with 2.9 million recovered. But that the SADC region is the one that's got the highest number at 1.7 million. And of course, of all of that, 80%, 89% of it is in South Africa. And the issue I think that uh, it becomes important is that uh, the only way of dealing with this a crisis as a pandemic is an all Africa approach where in all the member states of the African Union are able to collaborate, work together to try and find a solution and also utilize synergies amongst themselves to be able to take the best of their strengths to be able to, to deal with the, with the pandemic. This therefore leaves us as the SADC community with the need to recognize the fact, the, the level of interconnectedness of this region, where the economies, particularly if you look at the example of the growth of the economy of South Africa, it has actually uh, uh, drawn quite a lot of uh, uh, human resources from the whole of SADC, which basically means we are one uh, community <clears throat> that whenever we deal with issues, we have to deal with the issues as a community understanding that our people are one and that the political boundaries are not necessarily a deterrent for people from moving to from move to from, uh, from people to move from one territory to the other and therefore so do the diseases now we have been having a major burden in terms of the various diseases particularly the tuberculosis hiv malaria uh, all of which uh, made it very clear to us that uh, the fact that we are connected as a region will actually uh, be a, a factor in the spread of these diseases. Which, whilst we are to deal with them and focus on them as the specific diseases, there has been a kind of uh, defocusing that has been caused by the advent of the COVID-19 situation. That is, uh, I think what also what is important for us is to understand that the COVID-19 situation has caused disruption in our social lives as well as in the economies of all our countries, both through the problem of causing ill health, which therefore compromises the, um, the uh, capacity for our people to, con to contribute to the uh, economies, but at the same time, the mitigating factors, such as our lockdown, closure of borders and uh, travel restrictions have also uh, you know, had a huge toll on our economies. I just want to outline quickly some of the bodies that uh, uh, are involved in the response to COVID-19. I think <clears throat> from where we see the major uh, thrust in terms of our uh, fight against COVID to, uh, uh, to relate to the whole issue of case management, the issues of prevention and how we treat people who are uh, already infected. And that aspect is being handled by all, the, all our, <clears throat> of our institutions. But the next issue that becomes important becomes the whole question of uh, the prevention in terms of the vaccination. 
So the question of vaccination is the only way we see ourselves being able to deal with the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, spread of the infection in such a way that uh, we can prevent the um, uh, waves of the uh, pandemic, which keeps coming. In this case, we are <clears throat> on the second wave, not only the continent, but also in the rest of the world. And what we have seen is that most of the countries, the second wave has come to be much heavier, more fiercer, and cost more lives and cost more, um, more uh, hospitalization on the, uh, on the communities than the first one. It is also likely that we might face a third wave, and therefore, because there is no way of being able to prevent it, uh, we, we may actually be facing that uh, a third wave, which with its, its in impact <clears throat> would be even probably more devastating. So uh, we, uh, as part of the response, uh, this is one time we have a, a particular condition that has actually affected all countries in the same way, although uh, it is clear that countries with better resources have a, a better chance of being able to respond than most of us who are in the uh, continent, you know, we've got relatively less kind of resources to respond. We have uh, um, the focus at this point, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, the main focus had to be around, uh, you know, how do we deal with issues of uh, protection of our health workers, protection, uh, provision of PPEs, as well as the issues of uh, case management, provision of oxygen, ventilators, and so on. The African Union <clears throat> created a task team at that point, which task team had to focus on how we can help each of the countries to work together to find, um, uh, through pool procurement, uh, have access to markets, uh, global markets, which almost for all intents and purposes had closed down because most of the countries actually started uh, having a whole measure of uh, resource nationalism where there's, uh, most of the requirements were no longer able to leave some of the countries. For example, uh, you couldn't get uh, diagnostic kits and uh, some of the therapeutic uh, agents and so on. So the, to create a, a economies of scale, um, uh, President uh, Ramaphosa, as chair of African Union, then in, uh, constituted this uh, task team, which was chaired by, by ourselves together with the social uh, the Commissioner for Social Services at, at the AU. Now that actually assisted quite a lot, although there was quite a lot of contribution from philanthropic bodies uh, to actually help to distribute. One of the things that was very helpful at that point was that a formula was created to uh, distribute equitably across all the uh, members of the continent on the basis of the population and, and need. And so that actually became very, very helpful. At a global level, uh, we've seen the emergence of uh, such entities as what is called the uh, Act Accelerator, which is a, a coordinating body that basically pulls together various resources and is looking at various aspects, such as uh, the provision of diagnostics, uh, provision of therapeutics, as well as vaccines, as well as uh, you know, building of the health system. This particular area being chaired, <clears throat> co chaired by South Africa and Norway has actually uh, worked together with various countries uh, to uh, uh, um, motivate for the world to look at the fact that uh, every country has to contribute uh, equitably in the finding of the solutions and the provision of resources, even to assist those countries that have got less of such resources. And the other initiative that has come from that um, angle is what uh, is now called the COVEX, which is also a major focus of that was to cover the, when the whole world realized that there was going to be the need for um, vaccines, everyone went all out to put their resources to bet for the best vaccine possible. So most of the well-resourced countries and high-income countries actually invested in the development of the vaccine, leaving a lot of the middle and low-income countries without any kind of result. So this COVAX came up at that kind of level. At this moment, has got almost 190 uh, communities that are in there. But what is remarkable about it is that uh, in this continent, we've only got about seven countries that are self-financing. The rest of the countries have to uh, be supported through philanthropic uh, 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 support. And therefore, in the provision of the vaccines here, we have to rely quite a lot on this body, which is called COVAX. At this point, this body 
uh, is being formed through WHO, SEPI, Gavi, and uh, it's actually on the lines of the uh, uh, wide immunization uh, initiatives, wherein uh, the, it, it assists the countries on the basis of the fact that they've not been able to uh, finance their own. So they have, as COVAX, raised in, uh, uh, about a billion, just about a billion uh, uh, vaccines, which should then be one third of that, I think 30% or 32%, should then be available to the rest of the continent. This is where the, the, the challenge then arises because that 20% initially, by 27% at this point, uh, is not adequate to create what we call the herd immunity. It is clear that for us to get a population immunity, we need a vaccination of about 780 million people. All have to be vaccinated. Otherwise, that means that we will end up being the continent that is seen as the source of COVID when in fact we were the recipient of the spillover that came from different parts of the world. What we've also seen, which is a challenge, is the fact that uh, uh, there's already been uh, uh, um, uh, a pronouncement to the fact that no one can travel to various countries uh, unless they are already vaccinated. Now, at that point, you would note as well that the uh, uh, hoarding of the vaccine is a huge issue in America. Uh, Moderna, that is uh, got um, uh, manufacturing capacity there, can't export to any other country until the American needs have been, have been, have been sorted. Then in the European Union, they also ordered, um, they ordered about uh, um, probably two or three times more than what their population requirements are. Even there, they've not just now started making a call that there should not be any export of the vaccines whilst um, they have not uh, uh, fulfilled all the orders and the requirements <clears throat> in the European Union. So this basically means that uh, uh, once again, Africa has got a, a risk of remaining behind and being the one that's got least va vaccinated, uh, you know, uh, but carrying the highest burden of the infection. So from that point of view, uh, the African Union uh, under the chairperson of uh, uh, President Ramaphosa created a, uh, a, an entity which is called the African Vaccine Access Initiative uh, Task Team. Now this task team has actually focused on filling the gap and this gap is between the 20% to the 67% of the population that we need to be vaccinated in the continent. And out of that, we've actually participated here with a number of um, uh, players, uh, minister from Nigeria and a few others who are the envoys who have been asked to negotiate the uh, easing of um, uh, the um, uh, debt burden for, my, for, for most of our countries. And out of this process came this initiative that we need to find additional resources to finance the remainder, the gap between the 27% of the COVAX and the number that is needed for population, for, for population uh, immunity. Out of that process, then uh, the, the, the approach was then made to the Africa Exim Bank. And as part of this team uh, sits the president of the Africa Exim Bank, uh, President uh, Benedict Orama. And the arrangement here is that there will have to be a credit facility created for the states in the member states to be able to approach those uh, manufacturing companies to procure the vaccines for purposes of uh, vaccinating all our people and then use that uh, as a, 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 a buffer a kind of financing mechanism. But it's all linked <clears throat> to uh, uh, the uh, uh, initiative from the World Bank where the World Bank has set aside over uh, $12 billion, which must be used for various countries for COVAX related uh, um, activities. So because of that then, uh, the Africa Exim Bank has set aside probably something close to about two billion or so dollars, and then in total, it estimated that it could be needing close to six billion dollars for the whole of the continent. Which means, therefore, each country has to go into the Africa Exim Bank and make their own arrangements to have an advance that will be used to pro procure the uh, <clears throat> the uh, the vaccines. What is most uh, interesting is the fact that. Uh, uh, we're having a difficulty having access to vaccines, but we're not asking for them as donations. We are also buy, buying and paying like any other, uh, any other country. And because of that, then it becomes important for us to find a mechanism where the AU must then use its muscle for economies of scale 
to be able to procure huge amounts. So out of that process, the uh, Af Africa vaccination, uh, the vaccine access uh, task team has actually ne uh, negotiated almost all the uh, vaccine manufacturers. And at this point has secured about 270 million worth of vaccines, which all the countries, member states need to now access the um, Africa Exim Bank or the World Bank to be able to go and place an order and claim their share out of what has been allowed. Obviously, 270 million vaccines is not enough, uh, but uh, there is also some. There are also some options that are available. We have actually looked at the issue of um, the AstraZeneca as being the one that uh, <clears throat> seems to be uh, probably easiest available. Then there is a Johnson and Johnson, which, whilst uh, 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 at that point we, we didn't have the results, it seems to be very promising with good efficacies. And then, of course, there is Pfizer which has got very difficult conditions for cold chain maintenance at minus 70 degrees. Then we've got Moderna, which is for all practical purposes, very difficult to access because of both the cold chain conditions and the cost and the condition from, the, uh, uh, from America. And then uh, Sinovac or Sinopharm from China. Uh, this one is also quite effective, but uh, we still have outstanding results that we need. And then the Sputnik V from uh, Gamaleya Institute in um, in Russia, and this one was released yesterday to show that it's got very, very high efficacy rates. So all of these together are now the menu that we are actually going around. It is clear that you have to actually go for multiple supplier approaches, wherein we grab whatever is available on the market. But there's quite a lot of uh, challenges across the different um, uh, countries, everyone vying for the same companies and the supply uh, is, is not going to be adequate to give us all what we need now. However, I think the real pressure is that all of us and all the countries throughout the whole world are trying to get as much of a vaccine as possible between now and June. Beyond, beyond, after June, I think there'll be a lot more uh, you know, um, uh, capacity to manufacture more of these, of these vaccines. I think we need to then come back to a few principles, which I think uh, for me has been very, very important as a, lesson, a learning curve. Firstly, in the response to the uh, uh, um, COVID-19, the issue of unity of uh, all the people in the country led by the government becomes very, very important that the government must be ahead the way and mobilize everyone, all the sectors, multi-sectoral -sector response from all the uh, various players in society so that there's one message, one direction, one response. And that, of course, it's important to keep the principle of social solidarity that whatever gets done is done for everyone on the basis of equity and on the basis that uh, uh, it has to be done for those who are in greatest need, not on the, on, on the basis of those who have got the greatest means. And that for us has been a very, very important. So a very bold leadership with a clear you know, communication strategy and uh, accountability, answering questions, dealing with all the issues, so as to take people along because in between there are some of the things that create distractions such as corruption, uh, you know, mistrust and all of those issues, we need to be able to neutralize them. So we have learned as that, uh, we have learned from our experience that uh, there's also going to be a need to be more creative beyond the COVAX uh, facility. And of course, the AU is another uh, very important platform with the uh, state making uh, 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 funding available through donations and, and to, sorry, through, uh, uh, through the loans. At the same time, we also have to consider some of the bilateral arrangements. We have found the private sector very, very helpful, uh, both medical scheme and private business. And I think part of what this discussion should be is to look at whether we can be in a position to mobilize the SADC uh, business to actually work together to look at what can be financed to, to help us with the, with the, with the, with the uh, procurement of the vaccines. We've already seen one company that's operating throughout the continent, MTN has put up some contribution which has helped to uh, uh, you know, access some of the vaccines, which should, should be available for all the countries, particularly for the health worker. We are looking at, uh, uh, you know, the uh, health workers as to be the first ones to be protected. And then of course, all of those who are in frontline workers, as well as comorbidities. All of that becomes some of the approaches that we've all kind of agreed. All the ministers at SATEC general tend to be in good communication as well as through the whole, uh, under the uh, whole AU. There are issues to deal with of, uh, getting the community to accept the vaccines, the myths, the, the disbelief, the fake news, 
the, the mistrust on government and so on, all of these that have to be dealt with. All of that together means to us that we need to keep a com continuous communication, make sure that uh, between government and civil society, NGOs, business, labor, there's a free flow of information that allows us to be able to combine our efforts as we move forward. So all in all, I would say that, uh, yes, as SADC uh, members, we need to actually continue to work together. We must understand that uh, there, there is no boundary when it comes to COVID-19. People are gonna move, so therefore, uh, vaccination on the one side of the border means there must be vaccination right across. No one needs to be left behind, and that should be the purpose of our approach as we deal with this. With that, uh, moderator, let me just say from our point of view, we want to just uh, uh, encourage that the, the dialogue needs to continue, but you need to pull in those with resources to get them to work with us and contribute beyond what governments can themselves do. And there might be a stronger word and a voice coming from non-governmental uh, sectors. And therefore, let's take this initiative as one of those that can help to support the government initiative and, and, and limited resources from our governments as we're trying to procure vaccines. We will have to procure vaccines. We need to do it quickly, but at the same time, we need to make sure that we collaborate, share information, and see where, what else we can get as we share resources to make um, this response effective. At the end of it, uh, the, the SADC, together with the rest of the continent, should not be left behind as being the one part of the world where we can't travel anywhere because there are so much of restrictions because we are left behind. With that, let me say thank you very much. Uh, sorry to take so much of your time, but we'll be ready to part, be part of the conversation. Thank you very much. Minister. Thank you so much, uh, yeah, not only for what you've shared, but also to have done it in two thirds of the time that you asked for. Uh, that sets uh, a good precedent for our uh, subsequent presenters. Um, a number of uh, key points. The, a third wave is imminent, that's scary. Only seven African countries can self-finance. The rest need help. We are facing serious vaccine nationalism, not only from the developed North, but even uh, outside the developed North. Um, Minister, I don't want to embarrass you, but I want to challenge that when we come to the discussion, you try and educate us on the outcome of six meetings of SADC ministers of health and where that puts us. I appreciate that as chair of the AU, you wear uh, more than one hat and your presentation has given us much about the AU initiative, but being the only minister of health of SADC in this discussion, uh, please bring us closer to home and let's share what is being done in our region. A very important note I took of your concluding remarks. As SADC, we need to continue to work together. Tell us when we started working together, what we have done so far, and what we must continue doing. This will form part of the discussion, hopefully leading to the conclusions. But once again, Mwole Kakulu, Minister Mkize, very informative and uh, at the fingertips. I'm sure when we come to the discussion, we will call on you a lot more. It's my pleasure now to invite Professor Sheila Hill, uh, former Minister of Health of Botswana and uh, a very prominent health person. Over to you, Sheila. Great, I needed to be unmuted. Thank you very much. Uh, let me thank uh, SAPES. Uh, trust for, for organizing this. I think it's really great that we get to discuss and see how we assist and how we, we lobby. Some of us come from civil society, so we are more used to lobbying and advocating than anything else. I may be a politician, but I like that, that aspect even more. Uh, and I want to, to thank you, Minister, because you've touched on you know almost everything that needed to be touched. That's why, that's why, that's why I said, well, I don't think I'll need a lot more time. But I wanted to just take us back a little bit to that history. That yes, as SADC, at ministerial level, 
we always knew that we had to work together to be able to support each other and save each other from whatever was coming uh, you know, to derail us. So indeed, uh, when I was Minister of Health, one of the two things that we, 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 we two of the aspects that we sat together with the Secretariat and really came down and said, we want a plan of action that all of us can be able to follow was the SADC malaria plan. And I know we executed that so well. We used to go spraying. I mean, we were even hands on as ministers. We'd go spraying on, you know, in Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and I'm go, you know, and 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 and, 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 and Angola uh, area. Go over to the Bumbo, Lumbombo region, Mozambique, uh, Mozambique, and, uh, Mozambique, South Africa, and Swaziland, and spray. And we saw the malaria epidemic actually go down to the point where right now it's just a question of putting an extra effort and SADC will actually get rid of malaria probably forever. The HIV action plan was really like the best where we're able to see down and even have scorecards to say, how do we do this one? And even then, even the pooling of resources, we were able to do that. So that for me, that shared responsibility and global solidarity needs to be taken forth when we are dealing with COVID. Maybe even more so because, as we are saying, the vaccines seem to be coming from outside. And I know the minister used a very nice word, nationalization or whatever of resources. This is actually, to me, I think is an apartheid when it comes to COVID vaccines. There is a certain degree of apartheid because it was interesting where when they were being manufactured and all those researches were doing, were happening, Af Af African countries, some African countries participated. And those of us who think we are lobbies were able to say, let's have a people's vaccine when it gets rolled out. But guess what? It's now rolled out and countries have hoarded them. So it is definitely a, 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 an apartheid that I'm hoping that we can be able to name it what it is and be able to lobby and see how then we go about to ensure that our countries, Africa and SADC, do get uh, the vaccines that are needed. Um, with that, I want to talk about, and the minister mentioned um, the, the, the SADC Business Council to say that uh, this was one entity that as a regional director, after I became, uh, after I, I, I left the minister, I was regional director of Eastern and Southern Africa. And this is the one entity I was able to work with the SADC Business Council in actually looking at HIV prevention. And we even got to the point where we're working with ministers, actually used to have meetings with ministers for forming a SADC fund. And we, you know, all the preparations were on and even the global fund started with putting in 80,000 US dollars as a starter start to, to the fund. But what then happened was, this nag came at SADC Secretariat itself, where we are told that no, you cannot have a fund for a specific thing. You know, it's got to go into the funds of SADC so that it is used generally. So I'm hoping that as you are talking to the business council and maybe even the thinking of a SADC COVID fund, you know, at the secretariat level, all those, uh, what should I say, requirements or even the, 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 the barriers that would have such a fund are actually removed because now we have to really look at how we go forth. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is really looking at uh, communities to simply say that as we, were, we are grappling with where we get vaccines and everything from, let's not forget to be able to mobilize communities because we can have those vaccines. If those people are not ready, if our people are not ready to be vaccinated, it will be exactly that, vaccines that have not been used. So I really am appealing to say, let's look at the very resources that we have, the human resources, starting with the chiefs. I like chiefs because unlike politicians, they are born, they are there, they're into the people's hearts and the people love them and adore them. So let's utilize the chiefs. I'm saying so because from my experience, I was able to end child marriages working with the chiefs of Malawi and the hyenas working with the chiefs of Malawi and even, even Ukutwala 
in, 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 in the kingdoms of Zululand. So, and it was interesting that when the chief said so, everybody listened. So let's ensure that we engage our you know, traditional leaders and then civil society and of course everybody else. So with that, it's simply to say that when we do get those vaccines, let's ensure that the logistics of they being the, you know, distributed are actually great because I've seen in countries, even in the US where they say, we have procured 43 million and only so far the ones that have been distributed uh, or even uh, given out is only 20 million and thinking, well, where are the other 20 million? So let's just ensure that we work and ensure that the ground is all leveled out so that when we do start, there are very few snakes. So with that, I think I'll, I'll end there. Thank you very much. Your time allocation. Uh, three points I note. We have had the experience of working together in the malaria plan of action, in the HIV AIDS plan of action. Why don't we have a COVID plan of action? A glitch in trying to resource the initiative. It couldn't be a special fund. It must be a specific, it must be a general fund. And then let's work with the communities, especially with the traditional leaders. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, let me interpose gender balance. So now I have the honor to call on Caleb Fundanga. Caleb Fundanga is a SADC veteran. Uh, when I was at the Secretariat, uh, Caleb was at the National Coordinating Unit of Zambia, and he has moved with the organization in various guises. So he will be able to illuminate us in different aspects from the finance, business and public service angle. Caleb, your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Uh, it's nice to work with you after such a long time. Uh, obviously, this topic is one of the reasons which has been least prepared. Now, I would like to to thank, first of all, the, the Honorable Minister of Finance of South Africa for, oh, sorry, Minister of uh, Health, for a very informed discussion. I think his participation in the, all, all the initiatives that have taken place so far uh, has given him a, a very wide knowledge about what is going on, including also where we are failing as a region. Now, the subject region is uh, it's a very interesting region. Uh, last time when I was looking at trade in Africa, we found that in fact the Sadek region is the only one where a lot of um, there is a lot of intra-regional trade. We trade more amongst ourselves compared to other regions, which is something, and it, uh, it has got implications. It means that we've got to have communication channels, uh, roads, uh, railways, and so forth. Unfortunately, railways have been uh, destroyed in most of our countries. They are not operating efficiently. And yet, if we had efficient uh, working railways now, perhaps we would have prevented some of the problems that have arisen since uh, this pandemic befell us. Uh, because the railways are not good, uh, most of our traffic for this trade I've been talking about are uh, conducted using roads, trucks everywhere. The crossing, and I remember when the uh, pandemic just came out, uh, there was chaos at, uh, at most of the borders. Sometimes somebody's uh, quarantined on one side, when they cross over to go to another country, another 14 days of quarantine and so forth. This created so many problems. But I was imagining at that time that if we had managed to develop our railway systems, you would have one train coming all the way with just a, a tiny crew, and they would be able to pass through and deliver the goods to the country where they are going, or some of them drop on the way. It is something that certainly shows where we failed as started, because I recall that uh, the issue of developing the 
the railway network was quite important in those days when it was active in such uh, uh, issues. And we know that the use of uh, trucks, heavy trucks, uh, to transport even heavy equipment, as we seem to see in a country like Zambia, where, where with the development of a new copper belt, we have to transport a lot of heavy equipment and the road just gets damaged. Sometimes they just melt, uh, the tire just melts during the hot season. Uh, so uh, if we had done this properly, probably we could have uh, reduced some of the negative impacts of uh, this pandemic. I know, for instance, that uh, in some of the places where uh, the pandemic broke out, uh, I can give an example of uh, the, the pandemic actually broke out at, uh, at a, 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 a park for trucks. Some of the chips parked their trucks there uh, came with the pandemic and everybody who was staying there got affected, including the owner. Of, uh, that uh, parking uh, place. Now, we have also seen what happened during the Christmas period. I think the spike came out during this Christmas period. Uh, as uh, we have a lot of migrant workers in the region, when they are holidays, a lot of them return to their countries, either to just be with their families, with their families. The consequence is that the incidence of uh, the pandemic now in a lot of our countries in Zambia, Zimbabwe, and, and other places has been very severe after the Christmas New Year holiday. So uh, because of this, we need to find ways by which uh, we can ensure that there is compliance with the COVID protocols uh, in uh, all the countries. And when one country takes certain measures, it doesn't help if the others uh, are looking the other side. We all belong to the same side of the community and I don't see any reason why. When there is need to tighten up, we all should be able to, to tighten up. Uh, we know that at our borders, there is a lot of corruption. The minister alluded to this uh, corruption as one of the problems. And uh, what it does mostly is, even when uh, it has been announced that people cannot easily cross borders, they are easily finding their way out uh, by either bribing those chips at the uh, common borders or through other things. And this same problem, as the minister mentioned, also affects our procurement for uh, what we need. Now, let me move quickly um, to the issue of uh, financing, which again was very heavily covered by the minister. Uh, I think the IMF World Bank, uh, African Development Bank, which are all multilaterals, have taken various initiatives to put together some funding. Uh, what I think is important for us as Africans, or members of SADC, is to, to ensure that there is uh, equal access. Because we know if you have to, bo uh, to, to uh, borrow from funds provided by the IMF and uh, the World Bank, there are certain countries that may not have access because they don't meet certain conditionalities. Now, this is not going to be useful or helpful to us in the region, because if one country cannot access the funding, then none of us is safe. So somewhat, I hope we can use our, our regional uh, forums to ensure that these issues about equal access for all are uh, emphasized when meetings are held with these institutions, because not having some countries' access would not solve our problems collectively. Uh, I also uh, would be happy to see more funds provided by the IMF and the World Bank of a more concessional nature, because these institutions are our institutions. We are shareholders, and in fact, we are the borrowers. Many of the profits they have accumulated into reserves uh, because we have been borrowing each time when we have been in trouble. The developed countries never borrowed any money from there because they didn't need to. So the profits they've been making, or the surplus, whatever they term them, are monies which have actually come from the poor countries. And so it's for this reason that I'd like to, to see a pressure for more concessional resources from, the, from these three institutions, IMF, World Bank, as well as the African uh, Development Bank. The African Bank, uh, has, for me, has been one of the exemplary financial institutions because 
out of the many multilateral financial institutions we have, it's the only one which distributes profits. I say uh, in that uh, as a member of the board of that bank for 10 years and saw it grow. And that's one thing which pleased me because I was participating as a shareholder from Bank of Zambia and every year we used to get a dividend. So I, I, I therefore have some sympathy for them when they provide uh, facilities, but um, of a less uh, uh, concessional nature, because they also have to source this market, uh, the money from the market. Uh, but what has been contributed cannot save us, unfortunately. So it therefore means that as a, a region, we, need, we have to look inwards to see what else can be contributed. We have a lot of companies. Uh, we have a lot of banks in the region. I don't see why we can't start something because it's an investment into the future of those companies. If everybody starts dying, there won't be scope for running businesses in this region. So uh, an appeal of some sort should be started on the level of MTN uh, to see if others can come on board and they start making contributions so that we can have our own vaccine fund and encourage our scientific institutions. We have a lot of universities with a very good track record to start doing some research for COVID as well as other diseases that may emerge in the, in the future. Rather than each time, looking at what are the developed countries going to give us. Africa has grown up now. It must move away from always begging for assistance, even when it could do uh, something for itself. So uh, this special initiative, which I think has, has been mentioned by the professor, uh, worked very well uh, when uh, some initiatives started. But from what you are saying, it is also very clear that Sadek was its own enemy because that initiative was killed because of the need to have pooled funds as opposed to have specific uh, funds which address specific issues. I think when you have a pandemic like this one, you need to do something uh, extraordinary. Even if the need for pooling resources is there, we have to do something, otherwise we will not be arrived uh, in the next uh, few years here. So, so let's see what can be done in this area. Uh, commercial banks have mentioned can do something, uh, but there's another greater resource we all have, and these are pension funds. Pension funds do uh, collective uh, savings uh, facility, and every country does have, and they have a lot of money. If you harness properly, they could be the major investors into things like vaccine research, and I'm sure that uh, through such funding, it will be possible to develop the vaccines, which can even be sold to other parts of the world. And the money that will be invested uh, in uh, such uh, ventures can easily be recovered. I don't know how much these vaccines cost right now globally, but uh, you know, people don't even talk about the cost. We just want to acquire this, uh, these vaccines. But from what an article was reading recently, most of these companies involved in vaccine development are going to make billions from, uh, from this activity, especially in the beginning before the market is saturated. So this is more the reason why we must be at the forefront. I know, for instance, like if it comes to vet uh, medicines, Botswana has done very well. Uh, and taking that example of how Botswana has developed vet medicines, I think we can pick it up from there and start the developing medicines for other causes on the continent. Uh, moderator, I don't know how much time I have, um, but um, let me end there by just adding that many of these things that we have been getting from uh, the developed countries like PPEs and uh, uh, PPEs and uh, and uh, 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 and, and also some uh, what uh, sanitizers and so forth are things that can easily be made in the region. And the, uh, the knowledge exists, but we just have not put in some concentrated effort to try and develop this. It therefore means that industry must work in hand in hand, even if resources are there, if industry is not willing to participate in this collaborative effort, it again will come to naught. So let's 
put the finances together, get industry working, get our universities uh, working on these issues, and then we'll go up to something at least which can help us even in the future to handle similar catastrophes. Uh, I would like to end there, uh, moderator. I don't know how many minutes I've used. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb. Don't worry about the minutes. It's the important messaging you're sharing. Uh, infrastructure development, if our railways and bulk carriers were working better, we wouldn't need so many trucks on the roads and truck depots, which now present problems for spreading the virus. Um, migrants as carriers and the challenge to contact tracking when they come home for Christmas and go back to the workplaces after the holidays is a particular challenge that uh, we need to confront. But uh, stronger emphasis on our ability to mobilize our own resources. The MT example is something that could be emulated by a number of sectors in our economies, banking, pension, pension funds, and even uh, uh, other commercial entities. Uh, very important point as to how we can mobilize resources from among ourselves. Zikom Kwambiri, Bwana Caleb, I'm sure we will come back to those points in the discussion. My honor and privilege now to invite Paula to share with us the perspective from Mozambique and civil society. Paula, you have the floor. Thank you, so much. Obrigado. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? I can, I can. very well. Oh, thank you. Uh, I want to take this opportunity. Uh, I want to say uh, thanks the, this opportunity. Uh, and I think it's an, a very important initiative uh, to discuss such an important issue at this point in time where in most of our countries uh, we are seeing um, an uprising of uh, cases of COVID and uh, in the, the lack of capacity from our countries to deal with the, with the, with the pandemic. Um, allow me to start uh, by navigating a little bit on the numbers um, and I will try to be as brief as possible uh, to make my case uh, in relation to what uh, I think um, a strategy should should include and how sh should be should be managed. Um, uh, if we look what COVID data tell us first, um, it suggests very quickly. If you look at the numbers, it suggests that we just as uh, in Africa we count we only count for three four point five percent of all uh, COVID cases, um, and four point one percent of the all death. Although in numbers they are, they are a lot, but in 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 general they they suggest that uh, um, um, it's, we are we are we are less let's say um, uh, we, we we are less um, affected uh, by the pandemic. Africa is also perceived as a continent that has managed to control the pandemic uh, relatively well. Uh, however, there is a concentration of cases in southern region. So 48% uh, of cases reported in the continent, mainly influenced by South Africa. So it seems that all the concentration of the, uh, the, the burden of the disease or, and the pandemic is in South Africa and the other 14 countries um, contribute for 8%. I know that most of us know these numbers, but I think I just want to remember uh, to, to discuss part of the issues that also data omits. One of the things that I think it's important is we, we look to the disparity in the availability of tests and the reliability of data between and within countries. So in practice, within the region, we are talking about different things. For example, Botswana, Mauritius, Seychelles, South Africa, and the Sotin tested between 113,000 to 276,000 per million inhabitants while Madagascar, Malawi, Angola, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Lesotho range from 4, 000, only 4,000 to 22.8 per million inhabitants. This is a big, a huge difference. Um, in remote regions of many of these countries, tests are 
not carried out, or simple a province of 500 kilometers from the capital of Mozambique, for example, can take seven to 15 days to give test results. Either people have survived or they had died already, unfortunately. And these, there are also reports of cases of deficiency in handling tests and data. What, another issue is the limited access to treatment, public health units like, like uh, uh, materials, including oxygen, ventilators, and this, uh, there is also shortage of staff and not, not well trained to handle the disease. Um, if you look, for instance, the, 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 um, the, the so looking, uh, one example, for instance, that I can give, it's um, uh, just in Maputo city at the moment, uh, the public hospitals with just over 300 inpatients and it's, it's about to collapse. So can we imagine what to, to expect from health units in, uh, in provinces? Um, and the question I can make under these circumstances, can we expect equity in availability and access to vaccines between countries and within countries if a combined and deliberate action is, is not taken? Other issues that I want to raise as well is the overburden of the already fragile health systems. I know that we, our concentration now is on vaccines, but uh, we have a, an overburden of health already fragile systems and the consequences go beyond the limitations in the treatment of COVID. And it extended to other communicable and endemic diseases that are more little and are being neglected. I think um, the minister have touched uh, uh, those, those issues. For example, in Mozambique again, in July, the indicators of care linked to the children and the women's health in terms of vaccination, nutrition, malaria, tuberculosis, and, HIV, and, sorry, and HIV were already showing a reduction at that time. The other aspect is the effects on food security and nutrition of households and communities that are already impoverished with no or with limited social protection systems. In, 19, in 2019, just before the discovery of, of COVID-19, SADC estimated that uh, 4.12 million people in three, 13 SADC member states were food insecure, and most were children and women. So um, I think the COVID, uh, we know all know the COVID effects have exacerbated this situation, particularly affecting women in the informal sector and small scale farmers and children. The other issue that I want to raise uh, is the forgotten disease. This one is economic one, and it's related with debt crisis in the region, and also high levels of corruption. Has um, my previous uh, the previous uh, um, members of panel have have touched, um, with the exception of few countries like Botswana, uh, Tanzania, DRC. The other SADC countries have debt as percentage, a percentage of the GDP above 45%. Mozambique, Zambia, and Angola are between one, uh, are between uh, 107 and 123.57 of its GDP. The contraction, since we know that the, the most or part of the the, the, the resources that are, are, are mobilized are, are comes, are come in, front, in, in form of, 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 of lending. We, we, we know that the contraction of more debts needed to face COVID-19 may sink the countries even more if these resources are not properly managed. Um, one of the things that it's interesting uh, that we, 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 I think it's important even to discuss is that it's um, um, a civil society organization. Uh, we have been, um, and I want to share with you, we have been doing uh, lots of uh, initiatives from prevention measures, uh, strengthening the capacity of health systems, uh, socioeconomic impact studies, impact mitigation interventions, strengthening the transparency and advocacy of the response, particularly of funds mobilized for the, this purpose. And when we have also doing um, a policy advocacy at national and regional levels, particularly 
and not uh, in the recognition of the economic interdependence and inter intense interchange of people in the region and the need for a clear regional response. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the action from civil society, uh, uh, of course, um, uh, are limited, but uh, it, it, it has tried to, 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 to cover um, the various areas that um, I, I need. And one of the issues that we think that uh, um, it's important we want, at the moment, we perceived uh, uh, very timid actions from by SADC. Uh, we heard the new president, uh, the chair of SADC, talking about vaccines. But uh, apart from the guidelines uh, on trade and, and safe handling, facilitating transport of goods and services during COVID, um, few um, interventions from SADC we have been seeing. Uh, there was a socioeconomic st impact study. If you go to the page of uh, SADC, um, um, uh, website of SADC, you see that uh, the COVID monitoring information, for instance, uh, has uh, the, uh, the, the, the information is not updated. Um, the, the, bullet, the bulletin is uh, from the, of the website is from last October. Uh, we yet today we have a different reality. Uh, so we think, I think particularly that uh, um, it, it is, it is come to, we come, we all come to realize that COVID doesn't have borders um, and therefore answers must be regional and strategic. Um, I think um, given the, the, the numbers that I, I shared um, and the, 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 the uh, it's also important to, to think that uh, um, uh, any, any, any strategy and fund mechanism to, should look, my first point is we should look to analytic strategy and the mechanism that respond to complex interconnected health and socioeconomic problems. Um, I'm talking, for example, of supporting the health response, not only in vaccines. I know we know that vaccines, it's an emergency, but also the capacity of testing, capacity of, of, of responding uh, to, to treat, uh, the capacity of the, the, the health, health systems in some countries and most countries in the region are, are, are really limited. Um, um, uh, and uh, apart from that, there are other social issues, particularly social protection mechanisms that also should be strengthened uh, for peoples uh, and households in need. Um, it was talk, it was uh, uh, referred by other, 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 other panelists, the issue of leadership, which we need to see a more energetic action by SADC in terms of leadership and a clear regional coordination and strategy to combat COVID. Um, and any mechanism that um, is put in place, particularly in, in terms of funds, should be efficient, equitable, and transparent. Uh, and also particularly that aggregates value to the existing country efforts. I'm talking about efficient in mobilizing and managing funds, given the fact uh, that um, um, although there are few experience, good experience that we should, draw, uh, should learn from it, uh, most of, of, of fund, uh, fund mechanisms that we know uh, at regional level, sometimes they, 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 they lack um, proper process of transparency. Sometimes they are not efficient. And I think this, this fund this has to be quick, efficient and, 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 and easy so that the countries also can see a value on that. Uh, the second issue is, uh, that I was ra uh, raised in terms of equitability, um, it's uh, where, where the, the resources should be allocated with, in, uh, with more need, which countries have more need to, 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 to receive resources. Um, adding value to what countries are already doing, it's, a, it's an important point. Um, in terms of filling the gaps, in terms of capacity and fundraising, we all know um, uh, the, the the minister, uh, health minister from from South Africa, have raised 
that there are different mechanisms that uh, are possible mechanisms to, to, to raise to raise and to get funds. And we also know the trends, some trends uh, on, 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 on donors to tend to work directly with countries. Um, so there will be a, a bit of attention on that, I think. But particularly, I think um, that a, a regional mechanism should allow and should help to aggregate and not substitute or, 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 or try to, 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 to divert what, what countries are already doing. Uh, and finally, I want to raise the issue of transparency uh, and accountability, which certainly should involve civil society and citizens and accountability to citizens. And civil society in this regard, regard play an important role in monitoring the policy queries, particularly monitor the funds that are disbursed given the corruption, perceived corruption in the region that we know and also look at the impact that should be done. Uh, I will stop here now uh, and thank you. Muita obrigada, Paula. A very with the people perspective. Uh, the concentration of statistics in the southern part of the continent and within the region in South Africa. Is this a reflection of capacity for testing or a reflection of uh, the incidents, disparities within and between countries, the challenges of underdevelopment, how long does it take to get test results from 500 kilometers from the capital? We already have fragile health systems that are failing to cope with the existing diseases. Now competition with COVID, how do we cope? a broader perspective on food security and poverty, debt, how does that impact on our ability to deal with COVID-19? And finally, uh, for me, a very profound statement about the timidity of actions by SADC and an outdated website that doesn't tell us what's happening in the region right now. Key challenges there. Thank you very much, Paula. My honor and privilege to invite our last panelist, Marty, over to you, please. Good morning. It is my distinct pleasure to be included on this uh, esteemed panel with such respected leaders in our region. As a daughter of Zimbabwe and as an infectious diseases physician and public health expert, I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak to the pandemic thus far and the path ahead for our member nations. I've been asked to speak specifically to lessons learned here in the US where my work is currently based and also in the Northern Hemisphere in general and to provide my thoughts on the strategy for vaccine procurement and um, distribution. So as we all know, in December, 2009, we saw SARS-CoV-2 surface in China. Since then it spread to nearly every country with more than 76 million infections and 1.6 million deaths attributed to it worldwide, making it the first global pandemic in over a century. At the end of January, the United States saw its first confirmed case and shortly thereafter the WHO declared a global health emergency. Over a year out from that time, the United States has found itself leading the world in confirmed cases and deaths. And this is, on the backdrop of a polarized political climate and challenging public health response. And that's to put it mildly. Specifically, the United States has seen significant, significant disproportion burden of diseases, of this disease specifically in marginalized populations, black and brown communities in the United States. This phenomenon is not new though. Um, and has been seen countless times in the past with other diseases such as heart disease, cancer, maternal fetal illness, and more. COVID has simply shone a light on those inequities. And it is here that I believe there are multiple lessons that can be extrapolated to help inform our strategy moving forward, which I'll speak to in a few minutes. The most significant advancement in addressing this, the devastating toll this has taken on countries worldwide was the development of multiple highly effective and safe vaccines that came out of phase three clinical trials. However, it's only one tool 
in a toolbox that also includes, as multiple panelists have talked about here, testing, hospital management and capacity, and prevention strategies like masking, like social distancing, like hand, um, like, um, hand washing and avoiding large gatherings. However, once again, we are seeing woefully inadequate up, uptake of vaccines in a country that quite frankly has monopolized the market um, on these vaccines, having ordered the bulk of vaccine product that is currently available. I believe that that inadequate uptake in vaccine is for two reasons um, in black and brown communities. Number one, mistrust that is rooted in decades of government and medical communities um, having well-documented histories of abh abhorrent, absolutely abhorrent practices embedded in systemic and institutional racism. And secondly, due to a lack of access to healthcare in general and vaccines specifically, due to known social determinants of health, such as lack of transport, lack of telephone and internet technology to sign up for these vaccines or to even get information about them up front, and competing priorities that individuals in these uh, marginalized populations have, such as housing insecurity, food insecurity, continued work. You know, Black and brown uh, people in the United States as across the world are, take up the majority of essential work, frontline work, that put them directly at risk. We see similar mistrust in the science behind coronavirus right here in our regions. And this is for valid, let me be very clear when I say this is for valid and understandable reasons. How should our constituents trust the message of our ex-colonizers who have no credibility, also understandably within our communities? We have many leaders involved in multiple aspects of this that must be at the forefront of medicine, of research, and of politics. So I commend the leaders of this very call who are those very trusted messengers that I speak of. I believe that this battle will be won or lost with the approach taken to a coordinated, standardized public health policy and implementation strategy. So let me discuss now a few key lessons learned from my experience here in the United States. Standardized messaging from the highest levels of leadership must occur that then trickles down to individual states, cities, jurisdictions, and communities. The, 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 the politics that has happened here in the US and its subsequent polarization in the public is cited as one of the most challenging parts of the United States response to date by Dr. Anthony Fauci. Similarly, within the SADC region, we need the highest levels of, of leadership to provide that standardized messages, message that comes directly from our researchers, our public health um, experts, and that that is standardized across the region. If not, we will see the same fragmentation in response that we have seen here in the US that quite frankly has caused a, a failure in response to date. Another area that I think needs to be taken into account is when lockdowns and other strict uh, public health policy needs to be implemented. And this has to be in response to the data. The WHO has given clear guidelines around how the case positivity rate needs to guide our lockdowns. And I have seen this done very successfully and, 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 and in a way that quite frankly should be emulated across the world in member nations south, such as South Africa um, and needs to continue with clear communication to the public. Because here what we've also seen is that small businesses obviously suffer when this happens. And there has to be partnerships in how to help them maintain um, their, 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 their practices, innovation in ways to support them until we can open up safely. However, there, there will be short-term sacrifice that will have to occur for the long-term safety of our communities. The third area that I believe um, is, is, is one that must be looked at and has been spoken to by my esteemed colleagues on this call is around community partnerships. 
I have said, and I will continue to say that trusted messengers, what do I mean when I say trusted messengers? These are the trusted organizations and leaders who have already earned the trust of their communities, our chiefs, our organizations that have done this work as stated before in other um, um, emergencies, such as with Ebola, such as with malaria, such as with, H with HIV. They have already built the trust and some of the infrastructure that will be required for us to carry out this very vital task ahead of us this year and in the coming years. Those trusted messengers and, and groups and organizations must be the ones that are tasked with leading the communication strategy, the vaccine rollout, and the training of our vaccinated so that our the constituents of those communities um, will sign up and be on board to protecting not only themselves, their families, but also our communities. In the long term, I also believe that we need to center our researchers and vaccine development developers right here on our own continent. We do not have to be dependent on the efforts of, of those aboard, abroad when we have the, the best and the brightest minds and institutions right here who are doing this work and who understand what is needed for our region. However, this will require transparency and up-to-date data collection, which is one area that I believe that our resources should be funneled into. That data is what guides policy, what guides an effective strategy moving forward. I will close by saying that we have the best minds in the world right here in this region. Let us work now to pool the vast intellectual resources at our disposal and to center the leadership of our trusted messengers and community partners. Our researchers and our public health experts must lead, must. Our politicians must support them and give us standardized communication and messaging. And while we will depend on COVIX and other philanthropic um, efforts, we do have time now to work on strengthening our own infrastructure and fine tuning our public health protocols so that when vaccine is available, even in limited supply, the rollout is both efficient and equitable. This has not been successful, quite frankly, in the Northern Hemisphere so far. We have a unique opportunity at this time to lead and to show the world once again our greatness. I will continue to use my platform to strengthen this very message. And I hope that we will now focus our attention on the implementation of this strategy. Thank you so much for your time. Well, well, well. There is the fire of youth. Thank you, Mati. Uh, profound. Um, we need a standardized collective strategy, well coordinated. We need leadership, the highest level of leadership. Not leadership at the highest level, but the highest level of leadership. We must mobilize our own. We have them. We have the capacity to research, to manufacture, and to distribute. And we must be guided by our own science and our own intellectual capital. But let the trusted leaders trailblaze, those who are among the people. Profound. Thank you, Mati. Thank you, Zueli, Sheila, Paula, and Caleb. This is the end of our panels, panelist presentations and the real exciting debate begins. We do have time limitations. I implore colleagues who will want to make contributions, bear in mind contributions, not necessarily questions, to be precise and brief and to the point. Bearing in mind at the end, we want to synthesize some action points that we can take forward. Let me open this uh, session by referring to a quote that's in our concept note by an African, Obiora Okafor. The pandemic will not end for anyone until it ends for everyone. So for us in SADC, it won't end for anyone, any one person, any one country, any one community until it has ended for all of us. It's now my pleasure to invite discussion. Please identify yourself, very briefly make your point.
Thank you. I will be assisted by the host to identify hands that are raised for participation. Do I see indications of anyone wanting to make a contribution? If not, yes, I have Kaka. the... Yes, Kaka. Kaka Mudambo. Kaka Mudambo. Kaka Mudambo. Uh, I'm not seeing the hands raised uh, on, my on my screen here. Side. I see it on my side. Kaka. You see it on your side? Yes. How do I see it on my side? I think Kaka has to come in. While we are checking this technology, Kaka Mudambo, please, you have the floor. Kaka, come in, Kaka. Mikael, what's happening? There are three hands up. Mikael. Mikael, please help us identify colleagues who want to make contributions and also to put them live on the microphone. Um, I have Kaka Mudambo. Chitio and Sisulu in that order. Please, Kaka, go ahead. Ibo, can you hear me? Yes, there's Nox Chitio there. Nox Chitio. Is Nox on the microphone now? Yes. All yeah. right. We will come back to Kaka after Nox. Okay. Um Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to SAPES for this really fascinating um, debate and to our presenters. I've learned so much um, in this. Um, it's, uh, it's something I just put in, in the chat, but perhaps to, to all the panelists is um, really with regard to the wider Southern African diaspora, wherever they may be across the world. And I think the last speaker touched a bit on this. Um, can and should SADC be doing more with regards to engaging um, with the um, Southern African diaspora, Raz, plural, wherever they may be in the world, both in terms of um, knowledge um, sharing, in terms of um, assisting with resources, because the uh, diasporans are engaged, I think, with national governments and possibly with the AU with regard to this, um, but also in terms of knowledge sharing, because of course, as has been mentioned, uh, especially by the last speaker, a lot of diasporan health professionals have also um, suffered disproportionately from from COVID, wherever they may be across the world. So there may be things we can learn with regard to this. Uh, and also, with, of course, with regards to what can the diaspora do in terms of assisting um, um, with regards to, to, to COVID in, in Southern Africa. So it's really, um, can and how should SADC be doing more in, in this regard? Thank you. I hope, trust that our panelists are taking note of some of the points being made and that they will address them when we come to the next round of uh, panelist presentations. Um, Eleanor Sisulu. Um, thank you very Please much. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, and for to SAPES for organizing this a very fascinating and necessary session. I just want to point out to a couple of low hanging things that can be done without any cost, which can make a big difference. We don't need any money for. And that is that 
governments, our governments must respect and listen to our health professionals and our scientific community. Our researchers and public health messages, um, I think we've had a good example of the two young women, which is very inspiring. I, I see the leadership of the future of this continent. And so, you know, we have the Minister of Health of South Africa. It would have been good to have ministers of health from the other countries as well, um, to actually listen to the voices here and respect them. It costs nothing to listen to your health professionals and your, your researchers. Then the other thing I want to ask is that, and I uh, direct this to the South African minister, Comrade Zweli, that really South Africa has the capacity to produce, to manufacture vaccines and any other medical equipment for the rest of the continent. And as SADC actually, SADC could be a manufacturing force. And I really think that this is something that must be put on the future agenda, even if it means asking the Chinese to invest in the factories here. So our people work on these things. So that's uh, really on manufacturing and research and development to bring together the African billionaires. This kind of meeting we have had, maybe a meeting where you have the billionaires of Africa and talk about this and get investment into manufacturing. And then on SADC, SADC really has failed and SADC needs a complete and absolute and utter overhaul. If you can't even keep your website out of it, up to date, then you can do nothing for the region. And I, I really, I am trying even to find polite words. I, it, it angers me that you have an institution like SADC, which has resources, which is resourced, which does nothing. So I think that's something that must be addressed. And then finally, I just want to say there needs to be a discussion about Tanzania. When you have a, a head of state that refuses absolutely to comply with any public health uh, messages and this issue of sovereign, sovereignty must not get into the, the way of people's health because we'll have what is equivalent to a genocide in Tanzania if nothing is done. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. A very poignant point there. One of the aspirations, ambitions of the SADC Treaty is towards common values, common standards, common systems. How do we have common values, common standards, and common systems when we don't have the same or common views or beliefs? Uh, this, this Tanzania point is, is very poignant to this discussion. Um, I would like to ask the host to help us connect Kaka Mudambo, please. He is waiting to contribute. Can we hear Kaka Mudambo, please? Uh, as you uh, see, forget, uh, about, forget uh, about him. Get Nigel Nyam, Nyam Tumbu. Nigel Nyam Tumbu. Nigel Man Nyam Tumbu. Mikael, there's, there's Nigel Nyam Tumbu. Nigel, Nigel. Please connect Nigel to the microphone. There you are. Yes, uh, thanks. Um, my is a, is a quick intervention, uh, which uh, really uh, follows the contribution that uh, uh, you and uh, Elena has, 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 has made, um, following up uh, on the six meetings that the health ministers uh, in SADC have conducted, whether we actually have uh, a regional uh, framework, um, particularly around the regulation of lockdowns, uh, the opening of uh, borders. Um, we know uh, during this festive season, 
that the opening of borders, uh, particularly the Bay Bridge border, there were uh, issues, the Bay Bridge ground border, there were issues there uh, with uh, it being um, uh, a super spreader. And there's also been that example around um, these uh, policies not speaking to each other. So you are in one region uh, and uh, all these countries have different uh, requirements uh, in so far as uh, the, 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 there is no sort of uniform or, uh, uh, framework. So my question would be, uh, if there is one, uh, and if, if there isn't, uh, how effective uh, have been these uh, engagements uh, and, and, and collaborations? And is it still time for uh, SADC to just let uh, countries uh, uh, in their sovereign being, uh, you know, uh, have their own regulations, yet we are dealing on a, a pandemic that knows no borders, uh, hence the question of sovereignty uh, may not necessarily uh, kick in. So it's uh, to really appreciate on the bit uh, of, of, of SADC, yes, we've heard of the AU, but it will be also absolutely critical to understand uh, uh, SADAC, especially in the lockdown policies and also uh, transnational uh, movements and they uh, being uh, in containing the virus. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, colleagues, Minister Zuelim Kize needs to leave. He had advised us that he would be leaving about this time. I crave your indulgence to give him a couple of moments to make his uh, parting shots or uh, any remarks he may wish to make before we bid him farewell. Zueli, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Simba. Uh, it's very unfortunate I have to leave but I'm leaving at a time when it's beginning to be very, very interesting. And thanks to all the panelists for their very uh, you know, rich inputs. Just a few comments which one has to make. One, there was a question raised about the ministers of uh, uh, health, what the discussions were. Uh, the last meeting was in November, <clears throat> 18th of November. There was also another meeting which was part of SADC, which is uh, Elimination Aid. That one focused on malaria elimination strategy, which is also, uh, part of the SADC uh, program. The other programs that have been mentioned, TB, um, uh, HIV are there, and also others relating to issues of nutrition, HL strategy for SADC. All of those have been part of our conversation. But on the last one, in, uh, which was held virtually in Mozambique, uh, which was about the uh, preparations for uh, um, the, the response, uh, planning uh, response to COVID, planning the rollout tool, for vaccines, uh, which uh, was shared by WHO, and all of us in SADC are using that same play, uh, framework, but it's generally uh, uh, utilized across the world. And of course, looking at the issues of the allocation of the vaccines, and also looking at the target population, so that all of us have, have used the same approach generally in terms of the COVID-19. The point that's been raised right, right now, the last one, <clears throat> about whether there's been any regulation for the lockdown, I think what has happened here is that there's been a, the, the COVID-19 has come out with a very high, uh, you know, the rapidity with which it has set on has been a bit of a challenge. And the fact that um, the response requires uh, that there should be uh, linkages across different countries in the continent has really made it more an AU response than a, a specific set of response. There has not been a set of regulations to regulate to uh, uh, deal with the issues of lockdown, partly because the, each country has to respond to situations within itself. And I suppose this is something for the future, but uh, I think the time has not really uh, allowed the maturation of uh, that kind of a framework. Although all of us do understand the inconvenience that is involved because all the ministers, they start phoning each other to say, hey, listen, there's this cri crisis, there's this problem. Alignment of testing uh, strategies, aligning, alignment of uh, uh, conditions for entry and exit of the country. All of those issues do need to be cleaned up. I do agree that we need space there. The one point that I think is also quite important is the issue of uh, building on the capacity 
of uh, the continent and of course SADC and uh, to, to be able to ensure that we have got the uh, best research of, uh, possible, uh, research and development and manufacturing of vaccines and, and uh, pharmaceutical um, uh, products. This is a uh, one project that we all have to deal with. And I think that uh, uh, it's a good point to say we, we, we can't be caught again with the same situation where almost in South Africa, we found almost 90% of all we needed to deal with COVID, COVID situation was all important. And that really caught us out, uh, out of guard. So I believe therefore it's a direction to take. Uh, there's already work being done in, the, in South Africa, but I think the point about actually looking at the continent and looking at um, SADC, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good point to raise. The last point relates to the capacity for testing or incidents. I think here yeah, we, we must say that the, both of those are a, are, a, are a factor. On the one side, most of the countries will have capacity for testing, but even if you look at, um, uh, at um, if you look at uh, uh, the uh, capacity for testing, even South Africa has done so many of the tests, uh, several millions, we can still say there are many people more who, are, who have been infected than those who are positive, who are tested. So you'll never be able to accurately get the numbers. But in some instances, is also a problem that too, too, too very limited testing causes a uh, low number. So the balance is a bit uh, difficult to make. The, of course, I think the incidences of the different countries are not the same, but until we are able to get all of those issues of basic testing, uh, you know, capabilities improved everywhere, we may not be able to know exactly where things, uh, where things lie. But we have learned a lot of lessons, and I think that uh, the discussion is also raising up a lot of issues that we need to focus into the future. Thank you very much. My apologies. I have to uh, ask to be excused at this point. Thank you very much for the invitation, and thanks for a very rich conversation. Thank you. Well, I'm Thank you very much, uh, Minister Mkize. It's a pity you need to leave, but we know what burdens you're carrying on our behalf. Uh, go well. Thank you very much. Um, I do not see the raised hands. I want to invite the other panelists, Sheila, uh, Caleb, uh, do you want to comment on what has been uh, raised so far in the discussion? Any of you, you're welcome. Host, please help me identify raised hands. All right. Um, I am going to formally go back to the panelists and I will afford each one of you between three and five minutes to comment on the discussion and any other reflections that you might want to share as we move towards winding up our meeting. Uh, I will start with uh, the last, Marty. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank everyone for this spirited discussion. Um, I do think that a lot of very valid points have been, have been put uh, out here. I would like to specifically address those around um, the science and our medical and researchers being put at the fore and to expand on that a little bit. Um, I do believe that while resources are limited and this has become a point of frustration for our communities and I speak specifically to the availability of testing, of PPE, of um, ventilators, and um, hospital capacity in general, and obviously not to mention now the ability to acquire vaccines, that once again, we do have um, both medical and scientific minds um, here that, are, that have been very vocal in what is needed, being that they are doing this work actively. And I just want to advocate once again for centering them in these discussions and that the data that they have needs to be the one that is put to the fore. Um, I've also been approached about the availability of more cost-effective um, medications on the market. And we know that there's been a lot of discussion. Last year, it was around hydrochloroquine, you know, more recently around ivermectin and other drugs. 
Um, in my experience, the data has not yet shown us that there is a causal, a direct benefit with coronavirus. I believe that we need more data and more research and that we should be centering um, those types of efforts that are more cost, you know, cost efficient for our, our, our nations. We're currently doing research on another cost effective drug called um, fluvoxamine that I think will be promising. But I do want to you know, inform people that although we are desperate, everyone in the world is desperate right now to come up with solutions that it must, the science must be given the opportunity to play out as opposed to rushing to the market. So what I will say is that data transparency coming from our universities, coming from our medical practitioners, coming from our public health experts is what needs to be centered here. And I see a lot of that being talked about in the comments. Um, right now, we do have at our disposal not only our, in, our individual hospitals, but the African CDC um, has, 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 has been very active over the last year um, and other such institutions that we should be leaning into as well. Um, if there are any direct questions to me um, with those comments, I'm happy to take them. I know there were some questions within the, the, the uh, chat as well. Ma Mati, are you able to share reflections on the place of traditional medicines? Madagascar, remember right at the beginning of the pandemic, hit the headlines about a product that they believed would cure COVID. Mm -hmm. Any views on that? I believe that our traditional herb, um, medis medical practitioners should be respected. And, and let us start there and be very clear. At the end of the day, traditional medicine is uh, quite frankly, the, the foundation of modern medicine. And to this day, a lot of the product that comes out um, has come out of those traditional medicines. However, I take the same stance with traditional medicine as I do with quote unquote modern medicine is that it has to be led by data. We waste time and quite frankly, put people's lives at risk if we flood the market out of um, desperation with anecdotal data, meaning we see an observation in a few cases, right? And we then make the assumption that that then means that there is a, a direct response. I believe that uh, traditional medicine likely has something very powerful, very powerful to impart within coronavirus. I do not stand for, and I will not tolerate, at least in my spheres of influence, any disrespect towards our traditional leaders. They have kept us and our communities alive for centuries, centuries before we took part in this now worldwide and, 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 and uh, medicine me and medical practices. However, people's lives are at risk. So I do believe that we need to, 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 to collaborate with them and our current institutions that are able to, to um, carry out clinical trials, right? that have protocols in place to be able to show whether there's a meaningful impact. Because if we start flooding our hospitals with ivermectin prematurely, with hydrochloroquine pre prematurely, with any other traditional medicine prematurely, people will die. Let me be very clear, someone who takes care of these patients on a daily basis, people will die. So what we need is to center the science. The science has to lead our policy. The science has to lead our management. However, to be dismissive of our traditional message um, 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 leaders, of our traditional herbalists, of our traditional medicine is quite frankly disrespectful and has no place. We need to find a way to collaborate and to center what they are seeing and what they are experiencing with then being able to bring data to the table that will show whether or not there is actually a direct benefit. As of now though, the only drug on the market, at least from my experience and my evaluation of the data that helps hospitalized patients is dexamethasone. We should be trying to get more of that drug for our hospitalized patients. There are monoclonal antibody, antibodies that have been shown to also have data to help uh, folks who are, have mild disease to not progress. But of course, those are very much out of our reach in our region, right? So let us instead support, support the research of, of, of drugs that are being looked at right now, like fluvoxamine, like ivermectin, but be very clear in saying that the data is not equivocal. 
So we cannot be prematurely and foolishly flooding the market with them at this time. Let our researchers do their work and then inform us moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mati. Uh, very powerful, passionate, let's respect our science, but let's not be disrespectful of what ours has kept us for centuries. Paula, your passing shot. Yes, thank you. I have not, not much to comment at this point in time. I just want to raise on the different perspective uh, the issue of uh, traditional medicine. Um, while we, we May, we may not sure if we, we got uh, a response to, to treat um, COVID-19, but at least we know that we have um, immune system, how do you say, um, uh, um, medicines or, 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 or products that uh, our, our, our traditional medicine uh, can help to boost the immune system. And I think, um, and at least in some countries, you don't see so much that is, is how do you say, it's, it's, it's used or is uh, disseminated. It has been disseminated through WhatsApps, uh, social media, but I think um, in thinking uh, on, a, on a campaign, it, it, uh, in my opinion, it, it may help a lot in terms of, of, of response so that people sometimes have those products in, in at house and uh, or in the garden and they they can use for for um, to prevent the, the to prevent or to, to to strengthen the immune system um and one point that i want to insist is on uh, which is an area that i, I always meet interested in it's on how uh, the countries are, are investing um in responding to COVID. Um, while uh, resources are needed, uh, it's important that we, 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 we as countries in, in the region, we, 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 we borrow in a responsible manner. And I think uh, this is a very important uh, process that as civil society organizations, we, we think that it's very important to, to follow. Uh, and look particularly not only how, uh, how the, the, the funds are, are, are spended, but uh, are spent, sorry, but um, as well on the policy coherence. So we borrow for what? Is it relevant? How relevant it is? Is it going to the, the most needed? But as well as how the funds and money are, is used. So I think it's something that as civil society, we think it's important to. To, to, to follow um, and, and make sure that uh, uh, we are doing that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paula. Uh, Caleb, your turn. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 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 I, I don't have much to say, but let me just say this, that from our discussion here, it is evident that probably SADC has not done uh, much coordination on this particular matter, perhaps on other matters as well, because if people are gonna be complaining of even a website which is never updated and so forth, it's clear that there is a problem here. And for you moderator, you are, one of our early leaders at uh, SADC. So maybe this is an area where you could spend a little bit of your spare time to see how you can uh, bring that institution back to where it's supposed to be, because we'll go on dying if SADC doesn't coordinate properly. You've heard, for instance, how lockdown in one country, uh, it's not coordinated well, and it causes other problems in other countries. Uh, as we know here in, uh, in the region, South Africa is the biggest economy, and most of our countries depend on uh, uh, what is produced there. And it's important, therefore, that what is happening there is coordinated well to avoid uh, everybody uh, uh, suffering when one action is taken in one country. Uh, it is also clear that perhaps we have not been listening to our professionals 
no using them uh, to address some of the challenges we are facing under this pandemic. Now, we all know what happened uh, to a great power in mean, the US when the science was thrown through the window. Uh, so we, our leaders need not be persuaded on this one at all because uh, they, are, they, they have seen what has happened in recent times. But at the same time, as we look to our professionals, the mention of the diaspora, I think is important. Uh, these people who are in the diaspora are our own citizens, our own experts, and we should create avenues where regularly they can talk to their fellow professionals in our country and share, and perhaps even bring in new ideas and point out to certain new developments which can be of, uh, uh, of uh, use. The issue of Tanzania was mentioned. Uh, I think uh, probably, I hope the minister has taken up uh, the mention, uh, but it's important because we all deal with uh, Tanzania. And, uh, some of us are good to come through there, or trackers have to go there and so forth. It is important that we know exactly what is happening there uh, so that if we have to take measures, we can take them collectively as a region rather than having uh, uh, to deal with uh, these matters on a bilateral basis. Let me end on the, the issue I mentioned when I made my intervention on the financial resources. Obviously, at the moment, we're all looking at financial resources in terms of whether we can buy uh, the vaccines or other related uh, issues. But in most of our, our countries, even the, uh, the, the procurement of syringes it's a, it's a challenge, but even if you have the, the, the dosage, uh, you may not be able to uh, to inject it into somebody because maybe the syringes are not there. So somewhat, this issue needs to be addressed. And uh, as we look at the financial resources, I think the emphasis should always be that we need our own resources, either from government or from the business community, and so forth, but also the issue of transparency was mentioned several times by the presenters. I think Africa has let itself down because even when uh, we go begging, uh, the money which we get is quickly pocketed by some people. Uh, some of these things which have been given like the face masks and so forth, you find quickly they are being sold in the, by private individuals even on the streets. Uh, and yet the institutions that should have uh, uh, received those uh, uh, donations, uh, uh, don't have anything. Now, who is giving these to these chips, even the street vendors? Uh, I, unless we can start to address this problem, sometimes even our, our, uh, our call for assistance from other countries may fall on deaf ears because it will just be seen as one way of uh, um, uh, th those who are in charge of uh, themselves. Uh, let me thank you for a very lively discussion. When uh, uh, the convener first asked me, I didn't know whether I could make any contribution since I've not been a medical uh, person, but I hope I've made a little contribution to what has certainly been a very enriching uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caleb. You obviously have made commendable contribution and uh, we appreciate and are grateful to you for that. Uh, Sheila, uh, shall we have your parting wisdom? Yeah, I will take exactly those two minutes. Um, the one thing that has not been um, answered, the one question that was asked was about Tanzania. So I guess since uh, Minister Mkize has gone, it will remain unanswered. But for me, it's simply to say that, okay, we do have a protocol a SADC protocol, Article 23, that talks about collaborative management of disaster and you know, emergency situations. And we need to emphasize that and ensure that this particular emergency situation is really you know, um, dealt with in as a collaborative and unified manner as possible. However, with that, for me, you know, one of the things that I mentioned before, which I'll end with, is really to say that how, how are countries preparing 
when we do eventually get those vaccines, even the first batches that are, are coming, I mean, President Ramaphosa talked about the first batches that are coming. Yet at country level, what I'm seeing is that there is really no cover in the ground at ground level. For example, we only have social media. That sometimes we show somebody who was vaccinated and then they fainted. And therefore it's like, no, those vaccines are not okay. So that we need to have a proper information, education and communication, IEC, to really ensure that our people are prepared to be able to accept those vaccines. Because in the ultimate, that's exactly what primary health is all about. Healthcare that is accessible and affordable. And if the communities are not well prepared, then we, 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 we really will have a problem. We also need to find out who is going to do that vaccination. Right now, our health professionals are very tired, emotionally and physically. So we cannot expect the oneness who's also in the clinic taking care of patients to be the one also vaccinating. We need to have a strategy to say, let's call together and uh, retired nurses, for example. They are in every village, in every town, in any, in every one of our cities. Those are the people who held our healthcare facilities together when we didn't even have doctors. They can be called back and you know, re-educated and they can be able to do those vaccines right where the people are. So we, we let's just look now at strategies. And I'm hoping that you know what we're talking about will be communicated to SADC. For one thing, yes, we do have that SADC regional COVID fund, and they need to look at the processes to ensure that if it's possible for donors, for countries to put money in a fund, it should be possible and not have all those barriers that will end up uh, not benefiting anybody. So with that, it's ready to, to, to end to say, let's ensure that you know, we do have that end of the pandemic for everyone, everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you, Zueli. It's been such a fertile engagement. Uh, some few questions have been answered, but more, more questions have not yet been answered. A very interesting post from one of the participants here, which says this debate has been about the health of our people. Maybe we should have a big debate about the health of SADC. Ibo and your colleagues at SAPES, thank you very much for creating this opportunity. To all the participants on my screen, at one point we came up to 131 participants. Now we're down to 91. I would like to thank you all very much for attending, for participating, and apologize that not all of us could have the opportunity to make comments and observations. Once again, a big thank you to our panelists and thank you to Ibo. I want to bid you farewell. Have a good morning, Mati. Have a good evening, everyone else. And let's meet at the next SAPES dialogue on the health of SADC. Ibo, thank you very much. You can do the final honors. Thanks, Nyati. Thanks, Nyati. Thanks very much for fantastic uh, management of this process. One of, our, one of our best, no doubt one of the highest profile we've had, not only in terms of high profile people like yourself, but a high profile young people like Marty and Paula and having Sheila get out of the woodwork, saying a bit, and have my brother Caleb getting out of retirement and having to say something as useful as he, as he did today. I want to thank you all and all our participants across the globe. It's been a wonderful uh, 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 evening here with uh, hundreds, uh, 132 sympathies on Zoom and thousands on Facebook. And tomorrow the program will be on YouTube. You can download it as you wish. But I want to, want to thank you all, all of you really for doing us proud and for to Simba in particular for a wonderful management as a moderator. We'll get you back Simba. 
as, as, as you pay up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you to the technical team, Mikhail, Tony. Thank you very much. You have the music. Let's have Neria. Hello, hello. Hello, Doc. How are you? Fine.
sa ore moyo ganiri 